Hello, I'm Rabbi Sam Rotenberg, and each year it is my pleasure to introduce the teen leader who we've chosen to introduce the speaker for our Abner and Roz Goldstein Scholar in Residence series. We have so many amazing teens here at Sinai Temple, but this year we've chosen Aaron Yamin to represent our teen community in introducing our speaker tonight. Aaron is the vice president of our Teen Leadership Council and has really stepped up this year in terms of planning programs and inspiring his fellow teens to take ownership over teen life here at Sinai Temple. If you have a teen at home and they're looking to get more involved in Jewish life or you are looking to get them more involved in Jewish life, I invite you to reach out to me or reach out to Aaron. We'd love to have them in any one of our amazing teen programs happening here at Sinai Temple. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Aaron Yamin. Viewed as the nation's best legal commentator for two decades, Dahlia Lithwick is a senior editor and legal correspondent at Slate Magazine. She writes Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence and has covered the Microsoft trial and other legal issues, such as the recent appointment of Amy Coney Barrett, where she has shared her opinion on shows such as The Daily Show and Democracy Now. Her work has appeared in The New Republic, Commentary, The New York Times, The Washington Post, CNN, and more. Ms. Lithwick received a BA degree in English from Yale University in 1990 and a JD degree from Stanford Law School in 1996. Dahlia Lithwick is extremely accomplished. Balancing her career as a writer, she is a mother, a wife, and a committed Jew. I had the great pleasure of interviewing her recently, where we discussed Judaism's connection with the court and American politics. I learned how Jewish values are rooted in the successes of justices, such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and how the Supreme Court is becoming more and more political. With an unmatched ability to untangle the most complex debates, Dahlia continues to raise the bar in her analysis of the American legal system. Her boldness, clarity, and compassion shine through in her writing. I'm so honored to be introducing her tonight. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dahlia Lithwick. Uh, wow. So thank you, uh, Aaron. That was one of those introductions only a Jewish mother usually can give and incredibly meaningful to spend time talking to you and getting to know you and some of the middle schoolers uh, that I got to meet uh, last Friday. I, Whenever I despair of the present, I really take great heart in the future. You all are amazing. And I really want to thank uh, Abner and Roz Goldstein. I want to thank Rabbi Wolpe, Rabbi Rebecca Small, your staff, including the tech staff that has made it possible for me to come and speak to you, even though I really am in the clothes that I was wearing this morning. Uh, thank you all very much for coming back. I want to assure you, just as a, a precatory note, that all the doctrinal heavy lifting that we did on Sunday is behind us. I know some of that was very thinky and very abstract. Um, and now I think we get to the stuff that is not rooted in doctrine that is in some sense rooted in our hearts and our minds. Uh, but I do wanna start with uh, just the note that if you have questions, please, please text them because in about a half hour, Rabbi Wolpe will um, be in conversation with me. They'll post the number to text your questions. And I want absolutely everybody who wants to be heard tonight uh, to know that they can be heard. So please send in your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. And now I wanna really begin by quickly, quickly going over what we talked about on Sunday in our first lecture. And essentially, we just laid out the following. The First Amendment has essentially two clauses that pertain to religion, the Establishment Clause that effectively prohibits the state from establishing religion. And into that 
subset of, of uh, uh, prohibitions, we had conversations about school funding, prayer in schools, uh, public displays of religious symbols. And uh, essentially that is in opposition in some ways with the free exercise clause. That's the other provision in the first amendment that bars the state from impeding the free exercise of religion subject of course to neutral laws of general applicability. We talked briefly about a peyote case in which smoking peyote was seen as something that could be prohibited even if it was being done for religious purposes. And that's really because I think at that time the court said everybody cannot be a religious law unto themselves. The final thing is that that was somewhat tweaked by the passage of the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. We talked about RIFRA, which essentially says the government cannot burden the free exercise of religion except in cases of a quote, compelling government interest, and it has to be done in the least restrictive way. And that under that subset of cases, we talked a little bit about Hobby Lobby, the Little Sisters of the Poor, religious entities that don't want to be conscripted into giving contraceptives, for instance, or a Philadelphia foster care agency that doesn't want to be conscripted by state law into placing kids with same sex families. So that's essentially the, the landscape that we probed. It, does sound very thinky, but I think it's important to get us to where we need to go in the next two classes. And I'll just finally say that we ended up, I think, in the place where we said that the second half of the 20th century was kind of a boom industry for those establishment clause cases. So lots and lots of Supreme Court cases, litigation about prayer in schools, about crushes on public land at Christmas time, uh, about big crosses where you could put them where you couldn't, how we would fund um, religious schools. And then the last the, the, the first quarter of the 21st century, in other words, the last 20 years, that balance has tilted and we've seen kind of a boom time for religious liberty claims. So claims such as the claims of the Little Sisters of the Poor, the Cake Baker and Masterpiece Cake Shop, uh, religious entities that say that they do not want to be commandeered into the civil rights enterprise of the secular state. And so that's where the balance has shifted. And I think perhaps the most important takeaway from Sunday's lecture, and Rabbi Wolpe really pressed this, I think in our Q and A, is that all of these issues ranging from how we fund schools and how we use taxpayer dollars for religious enterprises, um, who uh, gets to be uh, exempt from federal employment law that prohibits discrimination, uh, crosses on public lands, uh, even questions of intimate decisions about how uh, we govern our bodies, our contraceptive lives, all of that is now front and center at the court, that the court has inserted itself into that huge panoply of questions. And that means that the court is in any given term making multiple multiple uh, rulings about religion at is, as it is practiced in America. So today's talk is kind of a flip of that talk because if we can stipulate, and I hope we all can agree now, even with my quick recap, that the court and the constitution have an awful lot to say about religion and a lot to say about how religion affects other issues, then the question becomes, does any individual's justice, does their religious faith matter, both in terms of deciding questions and how do we go about probing that in a confirmation proceeding? Again, with the stipulation that confirmation hearings are terrible, horrible things that do almost no good and I think do immeasurable harm. Put aside the badness of confirmation hearings, what I wanna to talk to you about today is what do you do at a time when a judge's faith may inflect upon their rulings, not just about religious displays or funding of uh, religious schools, but COVID restrictions and uh, 
applications to be absolved of those restrictions by religious entities or basic civil rights such as LGBTQ rights or the right to uh, contraception, uh, the death penalty, all of these issues intersect between religion and civil law as we think about it. And what do we do when we want to know whether a justice's views in any way are affected by their own faith? And here's where I'm just gonna pause to tell you, if you haven't figured it out already, that I've been covering the court for 20 years, uh, as Aaron said, and I have given hundreds of speeches in that time. And this is the hardest speech for me to give. Uh, I've given versions of this speech over the last few years at Catholic law schools. I gave it on the main stage at the Chautauqua Institution in New York. Absolutely nothing makes me more uncomfortable than this conversation, which is I'm, why I'm very glad to be having it with you and actually why I'm secretly glad that Rabbi Wolpe is here to help think it through in the Q&A. So the question is, why is this such a deeply discomforting topic? And I'm going to offer up one institutional reason and one utterly personal reason. The institutional reason, and we touched on this a little bit in the Q&A on Sunday, is it is widely accepted by court watchers, of which I am one, that any discussion about the role of any individual jurist's faith and how that plays a role in their jurisprudence is simply considered wildly improper. The implication that a justice would put their faith first or even on par with their constitutional uh, mode of interpretation or their constitutional views is anathema to the idea of justice, of true justice, of unbiased justice. The implication that a justice would let their religion guide them in any case, religious or otherwise, is considered really truly the third rail of how we talk about uh, the constitution and justices and judging in America. The example I want to give you is an interview that my colleague Nina Totenberg at NPR did with Jeff Shassel. He's a longtime court watcher, uh, an incredibly smart and deft thinker about the court. In 2010, she interviewed him for the first time about the fact that the court had six Catholics and three Jews on the court. And this was Jeff Shessel's response uh, in 2010. Quote, religion is the third rail of Supreme Court politics. It is not something that we ever talk about in polite company, end quote. And this was just around the time that Justice John Paul Stevens, who was retiring, described himself sort of regretfully as the last wasp, he said, that was departing the Supreme Court in a country that he noted was 48% Protestant. So we had no Protestants left on the court in a country that was 50% Protestant. And Justice Stevens saw fit to say, this is something that should be problematic. I think I also mentioned on Sunday, my one and only encounter with the public editor at National Public Radio came at the time when Justice Alito was elevated to the Supreme Court. And I said purely factually, I thought in an interview that he would be the fifth Catholic on a Supreme Court that routinely decided abortion cases. Uh, and I was asked to apologize for making that claim because again, the implication was that I was imputing some kind of bias. And I noted this on Sunday, but it's worth saying it again. We are currently watching the most religious court we have ever had in American history. More than half of the Catholics who have been seated on the Supreme Court in American history are seated now. There have been eight Jews seated at the US Supreme Court in US history, of whom three were serving until Justice Ginsburg uh, died this past fall. So this is a deeply, deeply religious and religiously self-identified court. So if you can accept, and I think we have to for purposes of this conversation, that we think about the Supreme Court as this country's secular church, we think of the Bill of Rights as its sacred holy text, we have to assume that any implication, that any justice is triangulating against some other holy text is heresy. It suggests dual loyalty. It suggests that they are not being true 
to the one faith, which is justice and neutral justice under the constitution. Now I'm gonna to cop to the personal reason that this conversation makes me deeply, deeply uncomfortable. And the personal reason is simply that these kinds of conversations have historically been very bad for the Jews. So in 1916, Woodrow Wilson sets off a tempest, a national furor when he nominates Justice Brandeis, Louis Brandeis, to be the first Jew at the US Supreme Court. William Howard Taft, who had hoped that Wilson would appoint him to the court, said this, note the dog whistle, quote, it is one of the deepest wounds I have ever had as an American and a lover of the constitution and a believer in progressive conservatism that such a man as Brandeis could be put on the court as I believe he is likely to be. He is a muckraker, an emotionalist for his own purposes, a socialist prompted by jealousy, a hypocrite who is utterly unscrupulous, a man of infinite cunning, I'll say it again, infinite cunning, of great tenacity of purpose, and in my judgment of much power for evil, end quote. And in case you didn't catch all those anti-Semitic tropes, even the New York Times wrote, quote, that Brandeis is essentially a contender, a striver after change and reform. The Supreme Court is by its very nature, the conservative conservator of our institutions. And in case the dog whistles didn't suggest to you how ugly, ugly the anti-Semitic rhetoric was around Brandeis, let me offer you George Wickersham, a former US Attorney General during the Taft administration, president of the New York Bar Association at the time of Brandeis's confirmation battle. George Wickersham attacked Brandeis's supporters as quote, a bunch of Hebrew uplifters. And William F. Fitzgerald, conservative Boston Democrat wrote, quote, the fact that a slimy fellow of this kind by his smoothness and intrigue together with his Jewish instinct can be appointed to the court should teach an object lesson to true Americans. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because as is often the case, when anti-religious bias or claims of dual loyalty are weaponized in discussions about what it is to be a true American, Frequently, the Jews really, really get sh absolutely shelled first and hardest, and that is certainly uh, what we see in the Brandeis nomination. I should add that when Felix Frankfurter was nominated to the Supreme Court, the anti-Semitism was so acute during his confirmation process that he actually had to show up in person and defend himself from claims of dual loyalty. It was the first time a nominee ever showed up for their own hearing. Uh, and as you can tell, this really was a, 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 a through line. The anti-Semitism that pervaded Brandeis, Frankfurter, Cardozo, uh, Justice Goldberg, was really very acute and it is why as a personal matter, it's very, very hard for me to be sanguine about having these kinds of conversations at all. Just parenthetically, and we're gonna talk about the Jewish justices more on Thursday, but even once he was seated, Justice Brandeis had to live with Justice McReynolds, another justice on the court, an associate justice, who was such a rabid anti-Semite that every time Brandeis would speak in conference, in their closed judicial conference, McReynolds would get up and leave the room, wouldn't even hear him speak. There's one year where there's no photograph of the justices because <laughs> McReynolds refused to sit next to Brandeis for the portrait. So it's not as though this ended for him uh, after he was elevated to the court. So then we get to the nut of my question for you and why I want to probe this issue with you tonight. If I'm right, that we need to be able to have some language to talk about the intersection of faith and judging. And if when that happens, it can be weaponized in the most pernicious ways to do terrible harm to the nominee and to, I think, claims of religious liberty. How do we navigate that? And I just wanna offer up this paradox by way of comparison. The justices who are currently sitting on the US Supreme Court have spoken openly about race and how it affects the way they do their judging. So I'm thinking of Justice Alito 
It is confirmation talking absolutely pointedly and heartbreakingly about his Italian heritage and what it means to him when he thinks about the role of race and nationality as he judges. Sonia Sotomayor, you may recall, spoke so movingly about her own uh, heritage, both as a Latina and as a woman, and how that affects the way she looks at the law by definition. Clarence Thomas movingly spoke both about race and class at his hearings and how that, again, by definition is baked into his thinking about the Constitution in the world. And famously, Thurgood Marshall would use conferences to talk volubly about how race, how uh, class, how everything that he was affected his worldview as a jurist. So we're in a funny situation where you can talk overtly about gender, about race, about class, about every other aspect of your upbringing. And religion is the one thing, the third rail, where the mere implication that it inflects upon your judicial worldview is not just horrifying, but considered disqualifying. So I think that what I mentioned on Sunday, but I'll just give you the quote today because I think it's very powerful, is that after many years of not talking about this, the uncomfortable hush around faith and the Constitution, Jeffrey Stone, who is the former dean of the University of Chicago, wrote this. And in 2007, this came right on the heels of a very charged abortion decision in which the Supreme Court in a case called Gonzalez actually upheld uh, a ban on so-called partial birth abortions. It was really the first time after the Casey case in 1992 that the court was kind of creating a new way to uphold a ban. This is what Jeff Stone said at the time, quote, here is a painfully awkward observation. All five justices in the majority in Gonzalez are Catholic. The four justices who are Protestant or Jewish voted in accordance with settled precedent. It is mortifying, he wrote, to have to point this out, end quote. And Justice Scalia was so affronted by this implication that the Catholicism of the majority justices had anything whatsoever to do with the holding in the case that he refused to go back and visit Chicago Law School where he had been on the faculty for years. He was just absolutely affronted and horrified. So what are the, the roads out of this puzzle? Well, one is simple. 60 years ago, Justice William Brennan, who was a devoted, devout Catholic, simply said that he would be guided by the oath taken to the Constitution alone. A version of John F. Kennedy's, I will be Catholic at home, I will be American in my job, and never the twain shall meet. That is certainly one route through this. The irony that I want to share with you is that Justice Scalia was quite possibly the most open and transparent of any living justice when he said, I don't wanna go that route. I don't wanna pretend that it is that simple to bifurcate the world. It was Justice Scalia who wrote in 2002 in a really pathbreaking article in the, in the journal First Things that he could very comfortably analyze his own religious views as a devout Catholic next to, in this case, the death penalty and what church doctrine said about the death penalty. And it was a deep, deep dive, a soulful dive, one that took very seriously both the moral imperatives of doing justice and of religion. In some sense, he modeled how this conversation might look if you wanted to seriously think about a justice being true to both sides of uh, his worldview. I should note though, that it was Justice Scalia who very, very comfortably attended Red Mass. That is uh, on the first Sunday of October, uh, the day before the first Monday of October when the court has its first session of the term. There is historically and has been for a long time what's called a Red Mass. It is at a Catholic church uh, near the court and all the justices attend as a Catholic uh, faith leader inveighs against abortion, inveighs against 
uh, homosexuality, Justice Scalia was very, very comfortable attending Red Mass, as has been Justice Breyer, who's Jewish. Uh, Justice Ginsburg stopped attending, she says, in 2009 because it made her uncomfortable. Uh, but Justice Scalia was very, very comfortable. You may remember he would wear that sort of jaunty Thomas More hat um, to presidential uh, uh, swearing in ceremonies, he was very comfortable living loudly and proudly as a Catholic and as a jurist. So what I want to suggest to you, and this is really the gravamen of what I want to talk about, is that I think we are now in an intolerable double bind where we either have to accept as gospel, so to speak, that there is no connection whatsoever in any individual jurist between their faith and their work product, or we have to do something that I think is worse, which is talk about it in really dangerous, sideways, coded ways that become very cartoonish very quickly. And this brings me to Amy Coney Barrett. Um, and as Aaron said in the introduction, uh, I did cover her confirmation hearing. <coughs> and I, in fact, covered her confirmation hearing in September 2017 when she was first elevated to the Seventh Circuit, that's the Federal Appeals Court, and very much in keeping with the conversation we are having tonight, Justice uh, then Judge, then Professor Barrett, had written, co-written in 1998, a paper in which she, like Justice Scalia, did a really deep and heartfelt dive into how a Catholic justice can reconcile their Catholicism on the one hand with American death penalty doctrine on the other. And they were very careful. It was, as I say, co-authored with a professor of hers. They were very careful to put aside abortion and to not deal with abortion, uh, to put aside other issues, and to talk about it really in the limited sphere of the death penalty, but again, with the understanding that there was a conflict baked in between church doctrine and American constitutional law. And they came to the conclusion that at least in some limited circumstances, a Catholic judge should absolutely step back from cases that involve the de death penalty and that implicate their religious conscience. And she didn't say you should fake your way through it. She was very clear in the piece that you should not try to conform the law to your religious beliefs or conform your religious beliefs to the law, but that you have to deal with it. And this leads me inexorably to the part that you may remember from 2017, the only thing anyone remembers from that hearing, which is Senator Dianne Feinstein of California trying masterfully to probe this problem and this issue. Judge Barrett, you have put this into evidence. You wanted to talk about it. Let's talk about what it means. Senator Feinstein uh, accidentally blurted out the memorable sentence. <laughs> Professor Barrett, quote, the dogma lives loudly within you. Now, bracket the Yodaness of that sentence. It doesn't even scan as a sentence, but she was immediately pilloried from the right and the left, uh, Senator Feinstein was, for going after Judge Coney Barrett's religious faith, for suggesting that the dogma that lives in her is somehow disqualifying, absolutely across the board from uh, Chris Eisgruber at Princeton to solidly uh, Catholic uh, 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 adherents uh, of the most conservative variety, everyone felt that what Diane Feinstein had done was wildly improper and out of bounds. And that in fact, what they invoked was the only other part of the constitution we haven't talked about, which is article six that specifies that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So the constitution explicitly on its own terms bars us from using religious tests for higher office. So what was the good Senator from California doing when she suggested that something about Catholic dogma lived so loudly uh, in Professor Barrett that she could not be on the court? So I'm just gonna note here that that was the backdrop that we found ourselves in last month 
when uh, Judge Barrett, now with three years of judicial experience of writings in areas including abortion, including LGBTQ rights, uh, including uh, the death penalty, issues that clearly implicate religious faith, uh, we had all that data in front of us from which to say, now can we have the conversation into which you invited us in your 1998 Law Review article when you said, let's talk about this. And as you all know, the sound of the silence was deafening. It was not brought up at all. Largely, I think, because Senate Democrats were terrified of a repeat <coughs> excuse me, of the Senator Feinstein misstep, but also because I think that we had all coalesced around the notion that any attempt to question Judge Barrett on any of these issues was solidly out of bounds. And I will confess to you on or off the record that I had a couple of conversations with Senate staffers uh, in preparing for these hearings in which I said, you will draw back a bloody stump if you try to initiate this conversation. I can see no way through it. As I said, I hope Rabbi Wolfe can help us think about a way through it. But I will note just in closing that there are things we could have and should have discussed, uh, not limited to, and I think this is important, the church that she belongs to, the people of praise, uh, is a deeply complicated, charismatic branch, a sort of spin-off church that has been very secretive and has wiped from all of its web pages any association with Judge Barrett so that there's a sense in which there's something going on here that is different from uh, uh, mainstream religion, possibly or not. I don't know if we can talk about it. Uh, certainly there have been allegations of abuse uh, of young girls in the church that might have been material. I don't know, again, maybe it's not relevant. Certainly I think it is relevant that she, that Judge Barrett served uh, on a board of a school that did not um, allow LGBTQ parents uh, to send their children there. Again, never surfaced in any way at the hearings. Again, I have no idea how it might have surfaced, but I will say that the thing that was an interesting marker that was not flagged or surfaced at her hearings was that Judge Barrett was the first justice in modern history not willing to say that Griswold versus Connecticut is set, settled law. And we don't have to go into the weeds of privacy law, but I will say that Griswold versus Connecticut, which protects the right of married couples to your, use birth control within the confines of marriage has always been deemed absolutely settled law. So the fact that she was the first justice, you know, Justice Alito, Justice Roberts, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, all had no quarrel with uh, Griswold. She was the first one to refuse to say that that settled law, again, might have been something that could have warranted probing. It was not probed at all. So I've said quite a lot now about what I see as the problem. I think we have a set of very religious people on all sorts of sides of religious issues, making lifelong determinations, not just about religious liberty, not just about the establishment clause, but also about very secular topics like abortion and civil rights and the death penalty. And I think that does have to have implications and I'm stymied by the inability to talk about it. So I started Sunday, Sunday by saying that sometimes these two values protected in the First Amendment, sometimes they clash. The state cannot establish religion. Nobody can be barred from free exercise. I saw in the Amy Coney Barrett hearings that absolute tension played out, personified in one person. And I just wanna close by saying this, I do believe that our Jewish values steer us toward truth, toward erring on the side of probing hard issues bravely with courage and also with great humility. And so I do feel a deep urgency, despite all the discomfort that I led with at the top, a deep, deep urgency as Jews to at least enter 
into some version of this conversation about does it matter, doesn't it matter, if it matters, how does it matter, how should it matter, most essentially how can we talk about it if it does matter. And I think that in the light of pursuit of truth, pursuit of justice, an understanding, elu ve'elu, there, it's complicated, there can be two answers here, that I'm really honored that you've invited me to have this, I hope, brave conversation with you. And with that, please text your questions along. And I'm delighted to invite Rabbi Wolpe to uh, help me <laughs> tough this out. Thank you. So thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. I mean, I think you basically solved it, but uh, nonetheless. <laughs> well, I'll ask you a couple questions. The first thing I wanted to ask you actually was, um, that I, I wonder, is this different than other areas of public life? That is, you don't ask politicians about their um, religious beliefs. We don't ask someone who applies for a job what church they go to. So I, I don't know if you can in any way carve out an exception for justices when we are more or less unwilling to do it in, in society in general? So a little bit of my puckish answer is, we do care deeply about politicians' religions if they are, say, Keith Ellison and they're Muslim, right? At that point, uh, not only do we probe it and press it and sometimes imply that it's disqualifying, but we care a good deal. And so I think, a little bit, we're back to that, you know, who whose religion who. right. is suspect, and I think that that's my my sort of simple answer. But I absolutely agree with you that you know we don't ask the checkout girl at Safeway, you know, what her religion is. But of course, she's not making in her daily job determinations that affect the religious liberty of everyone else. And so maybe the question is do we have some kind of different standard for our political leaders? And as I submitted, I think we do if they're not certain faiths, but more deeply, should it matter if those leaders are sitting on a court making very, very foundational decisions about faith for the rest or, of us? Or even, um, I know that uh, I, I remember, especially the first time he ran, that uh, Obama's presence in Jeremiah Wright's church was a subject of a lot of public discussion um, and debate. So, uh, so there he is, yeah, it's true, although it's a very, we, people feel extremely uneasy about it, I think, in public life in general. Um, so that's, that was one, and then the, the second part of this is that I think the reason that, that the analogy to someone talking about their Italian background or their race is not, uh, is not a perfect analogy in some ways, is that religion is in a different category in the sense that it is authoritative. That is, nobody says you have to obey Italianness and therefore do this, but you do have to obey if you are obedient to the religion, a certain thing. So it is, so the assumption is if you give validity to someone's religious background, then you are saying, they have dual loyalty. Right, right, which cuts both ways because it either means we should talk about it or that we shouldn't talk about it. Like exactly. it goes, it's, it's either doubly urgent or doubly irrelevant. But I absolutely concede that, you know, nobody would ever suggest that, um, you know, Sonia Sotomayor, by nature of being a woman, has some kind of imperative uh, to do something. Whereas clearly if you stipulate that Clarence Thomas is the deeply faithful Catholic, then already you're in problematic territory, yeah. So um, it sounded though, uh, that it sounded as, as if the issue was really largely a political issue. That is, if you say something that the other side, whichever side you're on, can use as a, you see it's an illegitimate religious inquiry, then you lose the game. 
And I'm not sure that it is ever going to be possible to eliminate that um, that kind of gamesmanship. I mean, you've watched the court for a long time. Do you think that could happen? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I was very struck when I was re-researching Justice Brandeis today. And by the way, those quotes were shocking. I mean, the, the level of just blatant, we're gonna put it out there about Hebrews and about cunning, um, that that just stopped, right? That by the time Elena Kagan is elevated to the court, famously, the only time her Judaism comes up, you may recall, is when Lindsey Graham asked her what she was doing Christmas Eve when the Christmas Eve bomber was, and she said, like all good Jews, I was ordering Chinese food, right? right. And she brought the house down. And that was the totality of um, the, the debate about it. And so there's a strange way in which, how is it possible that the arc of deep anxiety about Jewish dual loyalty seems to have ended with Justice Breyer, maybe with Justice Ginsburg? It's over. Nobody gets pressed on it anymore. And it, so it does raise this question for me of, is, there some, is this some kind of deeply anti-Catholic animus that, as you say, is being played out in a political realm. There's something different going on because whatever the worry is, at least with respect to Jews, it's over. We don't, we don't even right. count it anymore. And so that's, I think for me, the place where it's interesting. And I think in some ways it's because with the exception of Justice Ginsburg, who did talk very openly about how her Judaism inflected and informed how she judged, the other Jewish justices don't talk that way. Right. Scalia really, I think Justice Scalia, as I said, invited us into this conversation with him. And to a lesser degree, I think Judge Barrett did the same. Now Justice Barrett did the same. And so the other part of me just wonders if it's political, but also in a very, very interesting new way, it's political because there seems to be some pretextual desire to talk about it, but then also to not follow where it takes you. Right. Well, I have, okay, so before I follow up on that, I just want to ask a, a very, some, one, one person sent in a very cut and dry question. Why is there any tension? The constitution says there's no religious test, none. It's off limits, no exceptions. So why not just accept that and move on? Well, I think that the answer to that is it's not a religious test to probe it. Nobody is saying no Catholics on the court. That would be a religious test to say well, presumptively any per person of faith can't be on the court, but to say, this is interesting. You've written this, you've said this, you've served on this board, you've made, tell me how that affects how you judge is something short of a religious test. And so I think that was the answer to Senator Feinstein's to claims that she was imposing a religious right. test. She was saying, I was doing nothing of the sort. I was trying to understand if she says this matters, I want to know how it matters. So I think the cut and dried answer is it's only a religious test if you then say, I will never vote against a Catholic, I will never vote, I will never vote for a Jew again. That's a religious test. And and is the um, is it legitimate and and can it be so put put so boldly as to say, does your faith influence your judicial decisions? I think that was the attempt that was made. It was very funny to watch the rope doping that was happening in 2017 with then Professor Barrett because Senator Hirono asked a version of that question. Senator Whitehouse asked a version. In other words, there were many artful attempts that really right. culminated in uh, what Senator Feinstein did. And I think that you know her answer was pretty universally a version of Justice Brennan's answer, which is it has no impact whatsoever. Right. And maybe that's got to be by necessity, the end of the conversation. But I think it is just, you know, to, 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 to quote Jeffrey Stone again, what do you do when you have a court made up of five Catholics and four not Catholics and abortion restrictions keep 
being upheld. Like it, it just feels as though we're missing a beat. And that I think is the problem that Senator Whitehouse and Senator Hirono were trying to probe. Um, I, I'm gonna take it, it for a moment in a slightly different direction because um, I, one of the questions, which is an interesting one that we did not talk about was somebody asked, uh, what are your thoughts when a free exercise case involves discriminating against or disadvantaging someone who's a member of uh, a certain class, like I won't serve uh, black people or I won't serve, um, I don't know, uh, people, Jews, I won't serve, you know, as opposed to um, my religion won't allow me to serve LGBTQ cakes. Um, how different is that uh, legally? Yeah, I mean, that came up a lot in Masterpiece Cake Shop. Justice Kagan pressed very, very hard on the slippage between saying I won't serve same-sex couples and I won't serve, um, you know, African-Americans. Right. And, you know, I think there's a technical answer, which is that one is a, you know, under the sort of worldview of the Constitution, one is a super, super protected class and one is, you know, doesn't maybe get as much protection. But I think the real answer is that when you look back at Brown versus Board of Education, if you look at the original ruling in the district court in Brown, that was the case that desegregated the schools, the claims were all being made as religious liberty claims. They were being made, the judge who wrote the lower court opinion, uh, which people should look up, I'll pop it in the chat if I have a minute, but the, the, the judge wrote things about how God wanted the like, you know, white people to be with the white people and the Chinese people to be with the Chinese. It was all rooted in religion. And a lot of massive resistance was rooted in religious claims about how God was absolutely not going to tolerate uh, the mixing of races. And so it's interesting because I think that the, a lot of the, what we heard in the marriage equality cases or in some of these um, cases now that are saying I can't be uh, forced to do X for same-sex couples rings exactly in the key of the, the actual written opinions in some of the race cases. So there's, there's really a straight line there that um, we've a little bit has been lost to history, but that was absolutely argued and strongly felt in and in loving in the anti-miscegenation case, same thing that God doesn't want black and white people to marry. And that's like, all we need to do is, is say that. And, and history is I think a little bit lost the way those, those were religious claims at one time. Um, I, I know that I am jumping around and jumping back but that's how the questions are coming in. So do you think that the reaction to Dianne Feinstein had anything to do with the sound of her last name? Ah, is that a question that someone sent in? It actually never occurred to me. Yes. Um, you know, I, they I said because of a misconception of her faith and her last name. That was how it was put. I, I rephrased it slightly, but you know, it, it never occurred to me until you asked it. It it probably is absolutely a factor in the reaction. Um, I will note that Jeff Stone at University of Chicago, also Jewish. Uh, when he when he made his observation about the Catholic non-Catholic split, uh, it became an issue that 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 people thought that a Jewish person was calling out the courts Catholic. So yeah, I guess I would be naive to say it wasn't a factor, although I'm naive enough that it didn't occur to me. Um, do you speaking of occurring to you, someone else someone also asked whether the failure of Abe Fortas to become Chief Justice was in part due to anti-Semitism. I think so. I mean, I think, you know, and we're, we're gonna talk about the Jewish justices on um, right. Thursday, but I, I, I do think that, look, there's no question, I think we could all agree there was some financial impropriety the question what, you know, he was was kind of getting money for, for lectureships and it, some of it looked very hinky. Uh, the question was, was it all that different from what other people were doing? And again, I just to go back to the Diane Feinstein question, is it 
that there's some sense that when Jews are engaging in financial uh, impropriety, there's something highly suspect. And I think that's a that's a, a again. It seems to me that um, it has to be somewhere in the equation that uh, this was about a, a Jew seemingly being stealthy and hiding money. Um. Someone asked about the, the question of originalism, um, and and it does occur to me, and I think that, that this is a point that you've made, but uh, knowing knowing not very much about law, um, but having spent my life studying Jewish texts, it's impossible, I think, for a Jew to be a strict constructionist, um, because you can never do that with a Jewish text. The Torah is, no, no rabbi ever says, all you have to do is go read the Torah, it'll give you all the answers because that's not the way the tradition is set up. It's an exegetical and interpretive tradition. So do you think that that is one of those instances where religion must affect how you look at constitutional law? It, it's such a great question. It, you know, Ironically, I'm a, a senior fellow at the Hartman Institute and I spent the whole day today like in a knockdown drag out with Naomi Seligman, who is thinking about modes of interpretation, and I'm thinking about it through the lens of originalism, strict constructionism. Uh, so we actually ended up having a really fascinating conversation about the how you overlay, you know, the, the way uh, Jewish interpretive and translation traditions with uh, the toolkit that originalists use. And, and one thing I will say that I think gets lost a little bit in these discussions, but it's really important, is that um, originalism is an umbrella under which a whole bunch of different uh, approaches get clumped. So for instance, Justice Scalia would say, I'm not an originalist, I believe in original public meaning. I, right. I don't care right. what the framers believed, right. I care what dictionaries at the time m meant so that when people ratified the document, their understanding of cruel and unusual punishment is operative. So I think there's sort of original public meaning, then there's what is the intent of the framers, then there, you know, there's a whole bunch of different, you know, does it matter what the intent of the drafters were? How could we know what the, so there's a whole bunch of different, very Talmudic, you know, subcategories of what we mean when we talk about originalism. But I think that there is, um, you know, she was talking about the difference between like Ger and uh, uh, is it Tochar? Like the, you know, just the different Toshav yeah. tosh, and like all the different ways that even Jewish law thinks about different kinds of strangers or different kinds of like resident aliens. Uh -huh. And it yeah. was a really amazing conversation because it actually seemed that we were doing actually the same enterprise, which is it, trying to import contemporary meanings back into, completely ahistorically by the way, but back into um, what the, the, the writers of the words were. I guess if you're really doing deep Jewish exegesis, you're not worrying about the intent of the framer, right? Like that's- No, that's the advantage <laughs> you have in Jewish exegesis is, is that God can mean everything. Yeah. You don't have to say, oh, God could never have thought of that <laughs> because that's not so you can actually interpret in any way you want. In fact, that phrase, Ger Toshav, so the Magid of Dubno says what, what resident stranger really means is that everybody in the world should feel a little bit at home and also a little bit alienated. You should never feel entirely at home in this world. That's now, nice. it's a lovely interpretation. Did God mean that? <laughs> well, no. I'm not going to say he didn't or she didn't. Um, the, we're getting a couple of questions, which I'm curious to know whether you wish to, lay, to weigh in on, on, on issues of very hot political moment, like the question of court packing. Um, do you, uh, how much do you think um, adding justices dilutes, even a, take it out of the current situation, just in general? Um, if I had asked you five years ago, how much would you think that that adding justices dilutes the mission and uh, and and structural integrity of the court? Um, 
I mean, I, I think that we have to, this is another place where Americans get very, very religious, where they think there's something magic about the number nine. And they forget that actually nothing in the constitution says nine. And we have had historically six and five and more than nine. And we didn't really lock into the idea that God wanted nine justices until fairly recently. And so I think already, um, there's a lot of magical thinking about court packing, the implication being like, no, it has to be this number. So that's, that's the first thing. And I think we have seen, you know, Adams, Jefferson, a, an immense amount of quote unquote court packing in the early years of the, of the uh, f founding for explicitly uh, political purposes, you know, that presidents would say, I'm going to add two seats because I don't want my legacy to be reversed. So they were very comfortable with it. Um, I, I would say just the short answer is five years ago, I was emphatically opposed to court packing uh, simply because I think it's mutually assured destruction. And I think it's the quickest route. You know, we'll have 13 justices in 2021 and then we'll have 27 justices, you know, in 2026 and then there'll be 2000. Like, I don't see this as a, a, a very canny political strategy. That said, I, I think post Merrick Garland, my views changed somewhat and then post the death of RBG when, you know, this in this very compressed amount of time, uh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett was pushed through in violation and contravention of everything that had been said around Merrick Garland. My views have changed somewhat. So I, I think you can have, I, I don't have a, if the question is a kind of lofty, do I think it hurts the court or do I think it damages the way justice is done? Not really. I think that um, we've had different numbers of justices before we could do it again. I think as a tactical strategic question, it's a dangerous road to go down because it, it, there's no end to it. And I think that there are less thermonuclear fixes to some of these issues, whether it's term limits, whether it's um, jurisdiction stripping, there are, you know, the possibility the court just doesn't get to decide, you know, voting rights cases. Right. That right. Those things can be effectuated, I think, more readily and there's some reason to believe it would less harmful for the court. So that's, I think, where I come down on this. How much, I mean, the, um, the question of, of stripping the court of jurisdiction raises the larger question of how much do you believe, and this is a very broad philosophical question, so you really can take this in any direction you want, but I think it's a crucial question for our society. How much do you believe the court as opposed to, to the legislature should decide fundamental questions of American life? You know, that is in some sense the ontological question. And, and you led with that, you know, on Sunday where I when did. you asked I in did. a different way, you know, is the court simply too over-involved in every aspect of American life? You know, I, I think that the answer is yes and no, right? If you are a, a, a same-sex couple in a loving relationship, the reason you can be married now with all the benefits and privileges of marriage is because of the court. And that's a non-trivial thing. If you are a DACA recipient who was in fear of being deported three months ago, now you will not be because of the court. So I think that when the institution is working and now we can have a side fight about what it means when the institution right. is working, I think that a counter majoritarian check on the majoritarian branches of government is essential. I think that by design, that's why we got Brown v. Board because when the elected branches couldn't get it done, wouldn't get it done, will, would never have gotten it done, I would suggest, the court steps in. And I don't say that that sounds like it's very sort of progressive outcomes driven, but I think you could say the same uh, as, a, as a conservative about Heller, about the right to guns, right? The, the, the legislatures were never gonna step in. They were never gonna get it right. In 2008, the US Supreme Court said, look, there's a fundamental second amendment right to bear arms. And so I think those things matter. And I think to suggest that 
the court, you know, shouldn't play that role is to is to really give in to perfect majoritarian rule. That said, I think we're in just a really complicated moment right now where the court in many ways, largely through voting rights decisions, is kind of chipping away at majority rule in other in other words, I think we're now in a funny way. The court is not necessarily protecting minority prerogatives as much as it is helping, you know, with gerrymandering and vote suppression and and uh, Shelby County making it harder for majorities to so be heard. That that raises a, a related question. And this I, this also covers religion, everything that you've discussed, which is it seems to me that that of all the institutions in American life, almost all of which have declined precipitously in public trust, um, the court hasn't. I still think that people think of the Supreme Court with a sort of reverential awe by and large. Um, do you think that's true? And do you, and, and do you think that will sustain itself through this incredible political divide? It's empirically true. Uh, it's empirically true. And, and we've got the data to show it. And the data absolutely shows not only that, you know, whereas trust in Congress and trust in the president can be in the tens and teens, even at its lowest ebb, trust in the court is in the high 30s. And that, by the way, it bounces back very quickly so that after the Kavanaugh hearings, for instance, where there was a deep, I think, public concern over the court in some quarters, within a year, it was back. And so the, the court is, I think, in that sense, this precious public trust that for all the reasons I, I led with, it is the national church. People who don't believe in anything believe in the court. Um, yeah. And I think that that matters to the court. And it gets us a little bit back to the court cares that that's the only power it has. And that's why I think you're not going to see the court, for instance, decide this election. I, I OK, I have a new theory about why religion is not a legitimate thing to ask, as opposed to class or race or so on. Because, as you said, people will sometimes say in their decisions, because I'm an Italian-American, because I'm a Jew, because I'm a this and because I'm a that. Um, but nobody will say my religion has made me decide this. And therefore to suggest that it does, unlike other things, is to basically call the justice a liar. And to say, you're gonna hide this, but this is really why you're deciding this case. So you better tell me right now if that's in fact true. Now, we may believe that, but I think that that's a very bad question to ask somebody who has risen to the level where they could be considered to Supreme Court is, are you secretly going to favor something that you won't admit publicly? Tell me now. I mean, that's what's implicit in the question, right? It is implicit in the, I mean, part of me wants to say it's a tautology because the reason no justice will ever say <laughs> is you know, because this is a mortal sin and therefore I decided this right. is because then they really would be, I think. Uh, so so I don't know which way the, the logic goes or, or, you know, which way the imperative goes, but I think you're certainly descriptively right to say we can't be hauling every person of faith uh, into a proceeding to say are you going to be unbiased I do think and this is my concern if you really do have uh, even one or two justices who do believe that X is a mortal sin and that if they can you know eradicate uh, you know contraception or abortion that has very 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 serious implications for the rest of the country and that's where it really is tricky that 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 I don't dispute that the the sticky wicket here is how we talk about it but I still think that ignoring it or wishing it away, doesn't make it not a problem. Yeah, I just, I don't see a strategy nope. by which you can get somebody to talk about that honestly, if they wouldn't already talk about it honestly. And if they would already talk about it honestly, and in fact, their religion was um, the, the decisive factor, then, um, then they wouldn't make it to the Supreme Court in the first place. Right. 
Yeah, it is a conundrum. That's a it's tricky a, one. It's a pickle. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you get out of that. Um, so uh, the one other the one other question about the uh, that is interesting religiously is: Do you see a difference, not necessarily in the decision, but in the style of the justice religiously? If you wanted, if you wanted to write a forensic analysis of judges according to their religious conviction, would you be able to that was consistent? I, I love this question only because Justice Scalia's biographers have put a lot of stock in the fact that he was raised in like mamash, like really Catholic, Catholic, you know, Latin Catholic tradition. And I think he put a lot of stock in that. I think he lashed that to his judicial style. Um, again, it's interesting, like he very comfortably owned that, you know, that he learned how to think about text from the Catholics and like that affected how he wrote. Um, and I think it's interesting, there's been an immense amount of interesting scholarship about the fact that there are zero Protestants on the current Supreme Court in a country that is 50% Protestant and that all the Jews and the Catholics have kind of overrun the institution. And does that say something either about their faith tradition or is it some sort of broader cultural thing? I, I mean, I haven't thought enough about it to make any declamations. I, I will say I think Justice Scalia felt very comfortable saying that, and Justice Ginsburg too, by the way, was at pains to say that the Jewish text interpretive tradition was something that she felt she had inherited and that she brought to her work. So I think it's, it's on all sides. Uh, whether there's a sort of Jewish way of interpreting the law and, and a, a Catholic on the present court, you know, it's probably not an accident that all of the three Jews were liberals. <laughs> and, you know, and oh, although uh, Sotomayor confounds it a little bit, she calls herself a lapsed Catholic and she does tend overwhelmingly to vote with the three Jews. But I think that, um, you know, it's, it, it is certainly, there is something interesting going on that has led to these two faith traditions uh, becoming really, really dominant at a court that, as I said the other day, only had one seat reluctantly for either of them for most of American history. So. Uh, on Thursday, maybe we can talk a little bit because it is interesting that the Jews have almost always historically ended up on the left side of the court and the Catholics almost always on the right side of the court and that they say that has nothing to do with faith. But again, I have two. I want to wrap up with two questions. Um, I could ask you a hundred more, but I'll, I'll stick with two. One is, have you covered Supreme Courts in other countries and and how different are they in, in any area you want to take this in? Uh, the, the only thing I will say is that I taught at Hebrew U at the law school about six years ago. I taught a class on the U.S. Supreme Court. And when I tried to make these claims about really the, the sort of gist of the class was why are only 20 reporters left let in the building why is there no television why is there no audio you know why do we have to like have one right. notebook and one pen and it's very strange and when i tried to sort of as part of this course make the point that americans revere their supreme court my israeli students laughed so hard and so loud that, you know, I almost couldn't speak over it. Like the reification of the Supreme Court in the United States mm -hmm. is like nothing I have ever seen. And I will say, I, I have not, I mean, the, the, the answer to the immediate question is I have not done a, a huge study of how uh, other courts work, but of course the United States Supreme Court is the only court uh, in any uh, Western democracy that has given itself the final say. So other courts, you know, in all sorts of complicated structural ways simply don't have the authority that the US Supreme Court does. And so maybe that answers the question why the reverence is so intense in the United States. But I don't know of 
any other country. I, I, I was uh, interviewed by an Australian TV uh, station two weeks ago, and, and they were laughing at the fact that the entire country was riveted by the Amy Coney Barrett hearings. It's all anyone talked about, and they couldn't find a person on the street to name a Supreme Court justice. So again, maybe this dovetails with that question that keeps coming up is the United States Supreme Court has absolutely inserted itself in, as an essential component of right. how we all live our lives. And as a consequence, maybe it has become this institution that is both utterly revered and utterly feared. There is no analog that I know of. And so for people who've been watching and are now intrigued by the Supreme Court, even though they didn't really know or pay that much attention to it before. Would you recommend a book or two that you think would help us if we want to understand the court? Yeah, the best book, I mean, uh, The Brethren continues to be, The Brethren was sort of the classic uh, book uh, by uh, Bob Woodward and Scott Armstrong that was written really about the Warren Burger Court, but I think it, it was the kind of the ur text about uh, the inner workings of the court. Um, Jeff Tubin's book on the Supreme Court uh, and Jan Crawford uh, has a book on the Supreme Court, both excellent books. Um, uh, um, Joan Biskupic has written really phenomenal biographies of Justice Scalia, uh, Justice Sotomayor, and only just last year of Justice Roberts, each of which I cannot commend enough. And I think the last thing I would say is if people are interested, I think there is no better place to start than two really great autobiographies. Um, Justice Sotomayor has written a powerful autobiography, as has Justice Thomas. And I think there is really no better way to access both kind of the majesty of the court and the humanity of the court than these uh, judicial uh, autobiographies. And there's also just tons of wonderful podcasts, um, including mine, I guess, but just so many fantastic podcasts. Well, tell us about your podcast. So that uh, my know. podcast is, is called Amicus and it's bi-weekly, although for the last <laughs> three months, it's been every week. But um, mine is called Amicus and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. And we did an amazing series. I think I mentioned I got one of the last interviews with Justice Ginsburg. Right. Um, but we did an amazing series about the, her graduating class at Harvard Law School that had 10 women, 300 men. We interviewed all the women and we, that was an extraordinary thing right before she died. But really so many good ones. More Perfect is wonderful. Uh, strict Scrutiny is wonderful. So just, I, I will put together a list. How about that? And we'll push it out there. But I think that my like urgent request, and I think it was with uh, Aaron's, uh, the, the student who interviewed me put it in his piece, but people have to understand the court belongs to us. We need to not be afraid. Well, thank you so much. You talk about the majesty and humility of the court. I think we understand it a little bit better because of your wonderful and eloquent and very, very provocative and thought provoking presentation. And uh, we look forward to Thursday um, when you'll be speaking about the Jewish justices with Lori Levinson. And I think that should be a fantastic conversation. And thank you so much and good night, everyone.